Bueno, vamos a seguir con la siguiente exposición. Mientras muchos de ustedes ya están adquiriendo sus dispositivos, esta va a ser en idioma inglés y eh, nos va a acompañar un tema muy interesante sobre las claves para una innovación exitosa en minería. Y nos va a acompañar uh, Mark O'Brien, CIO de City Pacific Mining, quien estuvo ayer con nosotros con una presentación muy, muy interesante. Y recordarles que Mark es el gerente de transformación digital de Citic Pacific Mining, la operación de mineral de hierro de magnetita más grande del mundo y la mayor inversión en el sector de recursos de China, fuera de China. Así que sin más preámbulo, invitamos a Mark O'Brien y lo recibimos desde Australia con un fuerte aplauso. Okay, I need the clicker. All right. Well, morning, everyone. I hope you are feeling refreshed. I've discovered the secrets to uh, good sleep in uh, Peru is uh, the pisco sour. If you have a number of those, then you will sleep very well. So uh, I've uh, been enjoying good sleep since I've been here. Um, and we've had a, a very good conference, I think. You know, like um, uh, my first degree was in mathematics. So uh, the first session this morning, I... I quite enjoyed just seeing uh, how they're using some, some very clever maths to, to solve some problems. And uh, this is always a, makes me warm inside. So it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, let me move right here. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, mining, uh, you know, what I want to talk about uh, this morning is just really, you know, we live in a wonderful time. We, we do live in a wonderful time. There's so amazing things. You know, we, we've, been, we've been sort of joking about chat GPT and, and all this. But look, there's no question. This is an amazing, amazing technological advancement. It offers many benefits. Um, you know, so long as you understand the constraints and limitations, it, it, it does offer some amazing things to us. And not just that, but, you know, many of the sessions that we've been uh, exposed to here over the last day or so, you know, have shown us some, some really interesting technology. Uh, some ways of solving problems that are quite amazing. And, and I think this is important for us to kind of um, uh, sort of get a, get a good view and perspective here because mining, the mining industry does have a number of big obstacles uh, that are facing us. Claudio, uh, in his session just a minute ago, put up um, the EY uh, uh, listing of some of the key things that uh, that, that particular consulting group have identified as, as being some of the key concerns for us to be thinking about. Um, but, you know, as I sort of thought about, you know, what are the things that when I go to conferences, when I talk to my colleagues and peers in the mining industry, uh, the kind of things that are, that are concerning us, that are making us think about, uh, you know, the, some of the, the big expectations and obstacles that we've got uh, on our plate right now. You know, some of these things look like, uh, like this, for instance. Uh, there is a huge expectation, you know, where yesterday Don spoke about uh, electrification of mines, and it's not just mines, right? It's electrification of everything. I imagine, I'm not quite there yet, but I imagine my next, uh, my next vehicle, I currently drive a BMW, Marcel, you'll be pleased, a nice German car. I love my BMW, uh, it's a great drive, I love it, but I anticipate that my next car will be electric. Uh, and we are in this world where electrification is a huge trend. We see it as one of the key ways that we can sort of um, begin to conquer some of the climate change issues. But, but many of you will have seen this, uh, this kind of graphic where we realize that uh, the demands on us as an industry uh, to fulfill this, uh, this, 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 this goal that we have about electrification, it's astounding. And, uh, you know, when I go to some of the conferences uh, in the mining space and people talk about the fact that, you know, we will need maybe 2.5 times, maybe, you know, it's just a rough guess because I don't think we really fully have grappled with some of these numbers, but we might need two and a half times the amount of copper that we currently produce. Uh, and, you know, Peru is one of the big producers of copper. Think about this. You're going to have to double what you do somehow. Um, you're going to have to quickly find new deposits. We're going to have to identify that they're worth exploring. We're going to have to be able to exploit those new ore deposits in a very fast, efficient way to fulfill the speed at which we're being asked to somehow meet these kinds of requirements for additional copper, for lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel, you know, just everything. Much, much more of it. And so we have a big challenge. How are we going to do this? Uh, and, and so we're, we're faced with those kinds of challenges. We're faced with environmental expectations. 
It was very uh, interesting to me when I was in the airport at Miami on my way here, and uh, I met this, uh, this older couple. It was very friendly, uh, you know, because sometimes when you're standing in airports, nobody talks to each other. But this, uh, this lady, she was from Peru. She'd married an American lady, uh, American man uh, from Chicago. They, uh, she told me they'd been married 52 years, 52 years, and they lived in Chicago. But they come down to P Peru every so often to come visit the uh, family and the home. And uh, she said, oh, why are you going to Peru? And I said, oh, I'm going to a mining conference. And she said, oh, it's very important to Peru. But it's very important that we, that we look after the environment, right? She was, you know, she was very concerned to, to you know, point this out to me. And yes, you know, everywhere we go, mining is confronted with this, this expectation that we need to do better. So on the one hand, uh, we have to produce more and find more resources. But on the other hand, we also have this expectation that somehow we need to do this in a much more environmentally friendly way, that we have to figure out this challenge. Uh, and that might mean electrification, it might mean a lot of things. Um, but this is a, this is a big challenge. Um, in Australia, this is a big one. I, I, and I can't imagine it's not any different here. You know, social expectations, the social license, the license to operate um, in our communities has gone up. Once upon a time, uh, people were happy for us to go dig holes in strange places and they didn't mind too much because, you know, we didn't seem to have much of an impact on anyone. Uh, and they could kind of ignore us for the best part. But uh, more and more recent times, people have become more concerned. Um, you know, uh, what is mining doing for the local communities? How are we supporting, uh, you know, more than just making money for the economy? You know, how are we actually good for the places that we are, that we are working? Um, and this is a big challenge. You know, one of the, one of the key things. Uh, I used to live near this town. So this is actually, this picture is a place called Kimberley in uh, South Africa. I once lived here for six months, and it's basically a town with a big hole next to it uh, because they basically dug a hole and the town grew up around it, and everything, everything in the town is kind of relative to the hole, you know, uh, which, is a, which is a strange place to live. But for some communities, that's how mining is. You know, mining is this thing that defines uh, their community, and it's very important for us to grapple with this challenge. Um, the other one is safety expectations. I often cringe when I look at safety statistics of years gone by. You know, when mining would just lo literally lose hundreds of people uh, in the, in the you know, uh, terrible ways. Uh, through mine accidents, through just bad planning, through uh, just poor care of people. People were seen as machinery, basically. And uh, we, weren't very, we weren't looking after them very well. And so you look back in history and you see that mining had a terrible record with safety. Um, both of my grandfathers uh, worked in mining. They both died of exactly the same thing, uh, mine dust in the lungs. Uh, my, uh, my grandfather on my mother's side died when he was 42 years old. I remember when I passed 42, I thought, that's crazy, you know, that he died so young. Uh, but this was the way mining was. Today, thankfully, you know, we, we have different expectations. And our people have different expectations that, that we're going to look after them and uh, they will go home at night to their families and uh, you come back again tomorrow and it'll be a safe day, right? So, so this is another big challenge that's on our plate, that we have to, we have to be safe uh, in the way that we operate. And um, this, one, this one to me is actually a big one. It was raised uh, in Claudio's uh, 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 chart that he had, um, but it's one that probably all of you uh, face, and that's the talent problem. You know, I've been going to mining conferences for a long time, uh, and uh, I, can, I can think back all the way to maybe seven or eight years ago. I remember seeing in a conference in uh, Montreal, um, in the um, in Canadian Institute of Mining, and, um, uh, and uh, one of the guys stood up there and he said, we have to make mining sexy again, he said. And I thought, I don't think mining's ever been sex sexy, but, uh, but he was, uh, you know, he said, we've got to make mining sexy, you know, because the young people don't want to come to mining. And it's... It's true. In Australia, even though mining is one of the largest drivers of the economy in Australia, when I talk to a lot of young people, they do not think of mining as a career to go into. And there's a lot of issues with why that is, but it's a big problem for us because when we look at some of the cool stuff that we want to do, um, we need those people. We need those skills. And uh, right now in Australia, definitely, particularly post-pandemic, uh, when we sort of froze a lot of immigration and stuff, this became a big, big challenge for us, the whole talent piece. 
um, was a, a big problem. So we've got a number of ob you know, big obstacles, big challenges, big uh, sets of expectations on us as an industry that we have to grapple with. Um, and, um, and that makes for an interesting time to, to be in this industry because, you know, as I said, there are great expectations about what we need to provide to enable a better future, but at the same time, uh, it comes with a, with a lot of interesting challenges to actually do that. Um, this guy, he is a very interesting fellow. He wrote a book on climate change, which is an interesting read. You may or may not necessarily agree with his book, um, but I read it and, I, and I've listened to some interviews with him because he's a very interesting guy. He has a lot of interesting views about, about the challenges that are facing us. Um, and one of the key things that I loved about this guy in, in some interviews is that, uh, you know, essentially his, his thinking is, is that, yes, we do have a climate problem. Um, but the ways that people are tending to panic about it and, 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 and freak out about this, this situation that's in front of us is not necessarily helpful. Some of the ways that we're trying to look to measure whether we're making progress or not, maybe not the best things to be thinking about. And even some of the solutions may or may not be the best solution. So I like it because, uh, you know, I'm a philosopher at heart and, and I like people with interesting arguments. So I like to sort of uh, take a look at it. But the one thing that this guy really impressed me with was uh, he said, you know, I don't think we need a panic. I don't think we need to panic about this because the one thing we know about humans and, and about mankind is that we are incredibly inventive. Uh, all through history, when we've been faced with crises or difficult things, we have found ways to engineer or innovate our way forward. And, uh, and he said, you know, I think I, I have no, no illusions that we will do the same in this particular crisis, that we will find a way uh, to innovate and engineer our way forward. And, uh, and, you know, and, he, and, and in that sense, he was actually really optimistic because he said, you know, uh, we, have, we have amazing technology uh, in our hands. We have some amazing potential technology in our hands and, and we can solve this problem. We can solve this problem in some sensible ways that actually will make a big difference. We've just got to figure that out. And I, and I think he's right. And I think this, this principle is actually really, really relevant to even us in mining to think about, right? Because I think this question is a key one uh, to, to answer, do we see technology in our business as a cost center? Like I work for the CFO in, a, in, a, in our business, right? right? So the CFO, traditionally the CFO is mostly just concerned about counting the money and you know, you want to do things and it's like it's more money, you know? And you say, but there's all these benefits. And he goes, yes, I know, but it's more money, right? And uh, so, you know, you can see technology simply as a cost center uh, or or you can see it as a transformational potential. Uh, and I think in the, in the mining industry, we're living in a time where we really need to rethink the way that we think about technology. For, for a lot of us, for a long time, technology has tended to be just spending money on laptops and phones and internet and connectivity and stuff like this, but, and not really thinking hard about how we transform our businesses. And we'll talk a bit about that in a second. How do we transform our businesses? Uh, in significant ways to meet these challenges that we have. Uh, because that is probably one of the only ways that we will meet some of these challenges. Uh, and so we've really got to rethink the way that we're thinking about technology and the way that we're, we're doing technology. So what I wanted to do today was just address uh, some ideas, some things that we've learned, okay? They're not, I, I saw the title says the keys. They're probably not the keys. They're some of the keys, okay, to, to seeing success in, in, uh, in applying technology to our problems. Uh, the problems I face in my business, the problems you face in some of your businesses. And if you're a vendor uh, here, uh, this applies to you as well. And, and, and we'll get to that uh, as one of the key things that, are, that, that we've learned, okay, around uh, how, we, uh, how we need to perhaps uh, work together on some of these things. So, uh, you know, in the mining industry, we've, we've, we've really not been good with technology, okay? Uh, over the years, we, we buy the wrong things, okay? Uh, I can't tell you how many, how many things that we buy that were the wrong thing to buy. Just people didn't really think about it. Maybe it was a good sales pitch, I don't know, but either way, they bought stuff and it just did not do it. We spend too much. We just spend way too much sometimes before we realize it's a terrible idea. I once worked, I won't say which company, I once worked at a very large mining company where I started a, a work on a project that had had a budget of six million. Six million to, uh, to complete this project. By the time I started, they'd already spent more than six million. And by the time I finished there and moved on to another place, they were up to 13 million and they'd sacked a lot of people because things were not going well. And what was astounding about this was is they had basically spent double their budget and yet they did not have anything that actually worked. 
It's pretty crazy. They spent $13 million and they had, they had a whole bunch of code sitting somewhere on a machine that did not run. Now, today we look at that, you know, with some of the, I know I've heard the word agile being used a number of times and a whole different approach to methodology to delivering projects, particularly, um, you know, software type projects where we, we want to kind of iterate our way and make things work along the way so we can see it. Back then we weren't doing that. You know, we spent $13 million. Finally, the budget, I believe, after I left, got up to $30 million, right? It's crazy. It's crazy. We, fe- we spend too much. We take too long. You know, there's a great adage. I think it's one of the best uh, little maxims that you can sort of staple somewhere near your, um, near your, near your desk. It's uh, fail fast, you know. I think, you know, it's a great thing. Figure out if something's a bad idea as quickly as possible and then walk away, you know, go do something else. That's, a, that's actually a win. The problem is in a lot of mining companies, uh, you know, and we're no exception in mine, is that uh, if somebody comes up with an idea, we try it, it's not working so good, but we've got to keep going. We've got to keep going with it. And everyone's standing there going, this is a bad idea, but no one says, let's call it, let's move to the next thing. No, no, we keep going, we keep going, keep going, and we, and we, we just take too long to figure out some things. Again, the agile environment that we're now working in is a good thing, and it's kind of changed our, 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 our mindset around some of these things. And one of the things we don't do very well is we don't engage stakeholders. Mining has tended to be terrible at this because we're filled with, with businesses, with engineers, lots of engineers. Now, I, I have nothing against engineers. I'm a mathematician at heart, so, you know, you guys are mostly correct. Just kidding. But um, that's, a, that's a math joke that seldom works, but uh, wait until I get to my physicist jokes. Um, we don't engage stakeholders because engineers tend to come to the mindset of, well, this is the right solution. Let's all just do it. We don't need to talk to people. Just put it in and let's do it, you know? And then, of course, you've got guys sitting there looking, going, what, what is this thing? We don't like this thing. No one told us about this thing. And, uh, and so we tend to just have issues because we don't bring people along uh, for the journey. Uh, stakeholder management is very poor. Very often, we don't do change management very well with the business. And so we fail. I, I, can, I could right off the top of my head name six or seven projects in our business that just failed purely because, not because the product was a bad one, uh, but actually, the product is really good, um, but the business was not ready for it. We did not work with the people, and so uh, we, we had an issue. And, um, and, you know, and the final point here is sometimes, sometimes we fail because we just don't even act at all. Mining sometimes likes to wait and wait and wait and watch and see what everyone's doing, you know, and we, we call ourselves fast followers somewhere, but it's a new definition of the word fast because we're not very fast. You know, we watch and we watch, and then by the time we think, oh, maybe we should do this, there's another product that's come out, and, uh, and now we're watching that one, you know, because we, we just, uh, you know, for, for whatever reason, we don't have the courage to act uh, quickly and, and to try things. Uh, so um, so we, we're, we're not good at this, is what I'm saying, for a lot of reasons, and there's some things that we need to really uh, take a close look at to, to address that. So what I want to do is suggest some, some ways forward, some things that we've learned, okay, that are, that are pretty important ones. Uh, the first one is this. We need to focus on true digital transformation. Marcel had a slide up yesterday. It was a really good one. I'm going to steal it at some point, and, um, and uh, I might mention you in the title somewhere in the little print, you know, how that works. Um, but, you know, this is one of the key things. In technology, we often have this triad, we call it, you know, people, people process technology. You know, we, we talk about that a lot in the technology space. Uh, and unfortunately, for the longest time, when we think about transformation, we think about technology. Let's change the application. Let's change the technology, right? And it's a terrible understanding of what digital transformation is actually about. Because digital transformation, in its truest sense, is actually about changing the business. It's about changing the way that you do business. It is about looking at your processes, as Marcel was saying. You know, taking a look at those things. Are we even doing the right stuff? You know, one of the things that we often talk about when we, um, when we talk about uh, autonomous mining is if you don't understand your process and you automate it, you just get bad quicker, right? You're just more efficient at being terrible. Uh, and that's not a good solution, right? So, so it's really important for us to actually have a clear understanding of what we're trying to do when we're talking about digital transformation. Digital transformation is different to digitization, I should say as well. Uh, in our business, we've had a lot of efforts where we want to get rid of paper, get rid of certain kinds of manual processes. And uh, the process stays the same, but we just add a digital layer, right, to kind of improve it. That's an improvement. 
That's not a bad thing. That's actually pretty good. I feel pleased sometimes when I don't have people bringing me pieces of paper to sign. Now it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a system or something that you know, gets me to approve it digitally. I love that. That's a good thing. But it's not true full digital transformation. Full digital transformation means really taking a good look at the processes, looking at the people, that stakeholder stuff, and actually working on those things as your priority. And then you think about the technology. You know, down the bottom is the technology here. That's the last thing. It's actually usually the easiest thing in many respects. If you really understand what it is you're trying to do up there, then this bit here is actually the easy bit. The problem is usually we have this wrong way up. And we're focusing on the technology. And then as Marcel said, we're trying to make people fit, you know, fit the technology instead of really figuring out how we do things better. Um, and uh, certainly in mining companies, this has been a big challenge for us. And so, you know, when we're talking in our business and trying to think about how do we, you know, how do we tap into technology and get the best out of it, we're, we're trying to force ourselves to invert that and make sure that we're focusing on the people and the process stuff first. Uh, and, then, and then we think about the technology. It's very easy to get to, you know, starting to look at vendors and looking at products. I mean, it's just amazing how quickly you get to that um, without really understanding what it is that you're trying to fix. Uh, what it is that you're trying to change. So that's a, that's a pretty key one. I might also add most mining companies, in my experience, don't even understand their processes. And this is you know, well outside of the SAP world. I mean, uh, tools that, um, uh, like Solonis, are terrific tools to understand what's going on in your, in your SAP world uh, in those parts that are captured as part of that system. But as most of you would be fully aware, mining is run on Excel, right? And sometimes there's three versions of that Excel. And every swing of workers that comes in has a different one and they do a different thing, right? And this is a, and sometimes when we go in and we say, okay, you guys want to do this thing? Tell us what your process is. And we get like three or four versions of the same process. And we don't even understand our own process sometimes. We're not consistent and uh, there's a lot of fogginess about this. So, so these are key things. Understanding what true digital transformation is and keeping your priorities uh, correct is, is a key one, right? It's one of the big things that we've learned. Here's the other thing, and this one I can't emphasize enough, small bets. Small bets. Uh, I am a firm believer in experimenting. Uh, trying stuff out. Trying to understand, is this actually going to work? Does this deliver value? Um, let, me, let, me, let me pitch a comment to, to those of you in the room who are vendors. okay? Because I actually think this is something that you could um, really learn and also help us with. Because a lot of the time, when I have vendors come to speak to me about their solutions... They want to run a POC, a, a proof of concept. They want to run a trial. And uh, the primary purpose of that trial, I mean, they're very generous often. Oh, we'll let you use it for six months. We'll put it in. You can see that it works. But let me tell you, the fact that it works is l the least interesting thing to me. I'm pretty sure it'll work because you wouldn't put it into my business and run it for six months if it didn't work. Right? The software will do its thing or the solution will do its thing. I'm pretty confident of that. What we miss in this whole exercise is really understanding how do we demonstrate value? If we're going to run a proof of concept or some kind of experiment, how do we measure that? How do we, what I want, what I want from you as a vendor, if I can be really blunt, is I have to go to my boss, the CFO, and I have to ask him for more money, right? And I need you to help me. I need you to help me to, uh, to show him that this is worth doing. This money that I'm asking him for, there's value. And we've demonstrated it. We ran a POC where we did this and we did this and we showed that we could get value. And now we can calculate if we, if we, if we scale this up and we go all the way, we can, we can see some significant value now. We've, we've demonstrated that. He doesn't care if the system works. I mean, you know, of course it works. Does it actually deliver value for us? This is a big question. It's, an, it, it's not rocket science. It's actually a really obvious question. But unfortunately, I can't tell you in our business how many times we've run POCs that have been pointless. They've been a waste of our time, and they've been a waste of the vendor's time. Everyone's put energy into making this ha thing happen, and it's been a waste of time because there was no next step. And so I'm, I, you know, I, I'm a really big believer that we need to think about experiments, and how we sort of take things forward in a small uh, kind of process. In investment circles, smart investors know the first rule of investment is don't lose your money. 
Most of us think the first rule is make as much money as possible. It isn't. Risk management. Risk management is the first thing that you have to focus on when you're investing in the stock market or, or a new business or anything, right? You don't want to lose your money. You want to manage that risk, right? And when you take small bets on new technologies, it's a way for you to manage risk. It's a way for you to sort of try something, give it a go, see how it happens. Does it add value? If it's a terrible idea, you didn't lose much. You can move on. But if it's a good idea, well, we didn't spend that much to figure out that it was a good idea. And now I can go to my CFO, whoever, the board, and say, hey, you know, we need, uh, I need 3 million, 4 million, 10 million to uh, take this further. And if I've got the, the evidence, and as part of this POC, this trial, we shaped it up so that we could show that there was clear value, then everybody's winner, right? And so that's what I want to say to you. As vendors, it's an important thing. Don't just run POCs for the heck of it. It's, it's almost certainly going to be a waste of your time. And it's going to be a waste of everyone's time because there's no next step. So think about this. And honestly, most innovation, most innovation is incremental. You know, it's just those small steps where we improve things. Um, the, the projects that I've found have been the biggest disasters have been when people have just gone out and tried to do these massive, massive projects without really understanding the value proposition, without really understanding the challenges and the, and, and the difficulties around how we're going to implement this thing. And we jump in and then we get halfway, three quarters into this thing, it's diabolical, and then we're asking for more money and, and the whole thing just goes, goes south in the worst way, right? So, so this is an important thing for us, small bets, small bets. I can't, I can't emphasize this one enough. If you shape up uh, this way of tackling new technology in your business, I, I, I think you'll find that the, you, you'll see a greater success in what you do. Uh, this one's an important one, anticipate the future. And it sounds easy, but it's not that easy. But I think uh, for those of us particularly in roles that where we're managing technology in our businesses, this, this, uh, this little principle here is an important one. You have to be constantly looking at the future because the future is happening very quickly. Uh, some of the things that Marcel put up, just showing the speed at which you know, some of these trends are coming upon us. This is, you know, in mining, we cannot afford to wait. We have to be looking. We have to actually be constantly taking a, a good view at what's happening, not just in mining, not just in mining, but also outside of mining, uh, where we can see these things, these new tools that are coming up. Um, we see the stuff our kids are playing with on their phones, and we think, oh, that's interesting, you know. And, and uh, there's so much stuff. I mean, you know, I always lament the fact that, um, uh, you know, most people, they go home, and they're playing with all these cool apps on their phones and all, and they come to work, and it's like, you know, they get a computer from the 1980s, and, uh, you know, a whole environment that's, they, they look at it and they go, God, this is terrible, you know, because we're just so slow in terms of taking on some of these new things. Now, there are risks with taking on the new things, which is go back to my previous lesson, small bets. But there are ways of really exploring the future. Um, and I think one of the key things that we need to be doing is constantly cross-pollinating, talking to other industries, talking to other people. Make up some, 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 some um, intentional opportunities to talk to people in other spaces to find out what they're doing. I do that all the time. I have in my calendar just people that I connect with on a regular basis. What are you guys doing? Uh, it's one of the reasons, you know, I spoke, uh, gave uh, yesterday a bit of a plug about GMG. Uh, GMG is an organization that's all about collaboration. It's all about relationships. It's all about talking to other people to see what they're doing. And that's really unique uh, because sometimes in the mining industry, we're all so busy with our heads down, working, working. And sometimes in certain companies, you know, someone says, oh, what are you doing? You think, why is he asking me this? I don't know. You know, like there's a certain kind of guardedness around this. One of the beautiful things about GMG is you make relationships, you make friends uh, so that you can give someone a call. You know, I, I find it amazing that I can call up someone um, in, in one, of the, one of the businesses in our city. I can call them up and say, hey, John, you guys are using this particular drill. How's that going? And he'll say, ah, you know, yeah, we've had this problem, that problem, but this is good. And I, okay, I just learned some things, just being able to phone somebody and talk to him. Or, um, you know, I've got a vendor who's talking to me about something and I can call up another friend who I know is using this vendor and say, how are you guys going? Is this good? Is it a good relationship? And I can get some honest feedback. And, 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 and I think this ability to communicate, to talk, to explore what's going on, what other people are doing, this is really critical. Unfortunately, it's just weird to me that sometimes we don't do enough of that. It's one of the beauties of these sorts of congresses, right? You know, you come here and over coffee and dinner and what else, you talk with people and, you know, you do all that stuff that sometimes we should be doing a lot more often. 
So, uh, so I encourage you, anticipate the future. And one of the simplest ways of anticipating the future is talk to other people about what they're doing. See what's working for them, what isn't working for them. And then you come along to things like this as well, where you get exposed to a lot of more interesting ideas uh, in a very compressed way. And you take away some ideas to go and explore and, uh, you know, you can uh, see where you go with it. So this is important, uh, anticipating the future, because the future is happening very, very quickly. Um, and we need, to, we need to really be creating the kind of workspaces, the tools for our business that are actually future ready. They're not, uh, you know, from the 80s and the 90s and we're sort of, you know, people have got... Uh, um, very um, outdated stuff that they're trying to do their jobs with. All right, really quickly, uh, we need to solve real business problems. This one's a key one. Uh, we, we, you know, we've, we discovered that uh, IT groups are uh, pretty poor sometimes at solving real problems. We're solving problems we think the business has. Um, but then when we go and talk to the guys in the business and actually explore with them what, they, what their problem is, we realize it's a different problem, right? And that's why I think it's really critical that we actually work with our stakeholders all the time so that we understand what they're doing, how they're doing it, where they're struggling, and that when we go in to solve things, we're actually solving the real problem. Um, we have spent uh, sometimes too many resources on solving problems that actually weren't the problem, and nobody was that interested in it. But let me tell you, when you solve a real business problem, people are very interested in helping you with that. When they can see that you're going to do something that's going to make their life better and easier, they're pretty keen to help you. But when you come in with your box of stuff and you say, you know, I'm here to come solve some problems and they look at you like, okay, great. It's the IT guys again, you know. Um, and uh, we, ha we have to really change that mindset and be, uh, be much stronger at working with the business around solving real business problems. Um, and that means really, again, getting out into our businesses. Uh, and mining is an interesting business, you know, because we sort of have the corporate space. We have the industrial space. And uh, sometimes there's a bit of a gap where we're not talking to each other very well. In, in, in our business, I'm based in Perth, our, our head office. Our mine site is uh, 1,500 kilometers away in the desert, a long way away. And we have an expression in our business. There used to be, a, when I started there, I've been there now 10 years, but I remember the first time I went up to our site to go talk to stakeholders. And I remember one of the guys, you know, Australians are quite funny because they can be very sarcastic. And, you know, we turned up to come meet with these people about some stuff and they went, ah. Oh, Projects from Perth, you know, that was the expression. Oh, projects from Perth. You guys have come up to solve our problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and they were right because really we didn't know what their real problems were. We were coming up with what we wanted to solve and it was a different thing, right? So, so this is an important one. Solve real business problems. Get to know what they actually are and uh, things will be a lot better. And this one here is a, is a really key one that I want to kind of um, throw out as, as perhaps my last one that's really important, Okay. Um, nurture the vendor ecosystem because, and this, this may sound controversial, but I don't think it is if you really look at it.
boring. They don't want to come be a part of that. But let me tell you, when you're doing cool data science, you've got data and whatnot. We have a young graduate working in our business. She's uh, got a finance background. She came into our business to do a bit of a, a, an internship. And uh, a couple of days ago, I sat down with her and she, she played back what she'd been working on. Very interesting project where she'd taken a whole stack of our data and, and, and done some work with it to show some, some keen insights. You know? And I said to her, do you really want to go back to finance? So boring. You should stay here in mining. And you know, she said, oh, I think I might. This is much more interesting than accounting stuff, right? Accounting data, finance data. You know, this, this, this maybe, you know, for just that, it was just that little opportunity for a light to go on that maybe this is a good place to be because we're interested in doing cool, interesting things with new technology. So, um, so I have hope that we might be able to actually turn it around and make mining sexy again for young people where they might want to come and work in a space where we're actually, uh, where we're actually doing interesting things and we're using technologies in the kinds of ways that they're using technologies because they've grown up with this stuff. And uh, for them, there's this expectation, and that's what the world actually is. Fortunately, they come into some of our, our businesses, and they, they quickly realize maybe this is not quite, we're not quite caught up yet, so not very healthy. All right, so that's it from me. Some tips, I hope, some really practical tips, I hope, that uh, maybe you can take back and, uh, and, and apply in your businesses in some way. Um, and uh, let's see if there's any questions. So, uh, oh, let's see. So, um, Key tasks or actions to engage stakeholders. You know, look, there's a whole science around uh, stakeholder management. Um, there's, uh, there's some great books, some great models uh, around change management, um, which I think are really worth looking at. Uh, there's the Porter model, there's, uh, you know, there's ProSci, there's all these courses that you can do and put some of your people through so that they actually have a bit of a structured approach to engaging with stakeholders. But fundamentally, Fundamentally, I think actually the first thing is to have conversations, just actually get to know people. Because to me, it's amazing uh, how much happens out of relationship. And when you build strong relationships, you build trust. And fundamentally, I think one of the biggest issues with um, stakeholder engagement is trust. You know, when I turn up with my box of goodies, they don't trust me. When they want to go do something, they don't call me. They get out their credit card and they sign up for a service online, right? They want to get into power apps and build their own thing. They don't trust me. So I have to build that trust, right? So I think, you know, uh, without being too clever about it, that, that is a fundamental thing that I think build the relationships, build the trust is actually crucial. Um, cool presentation. Thank you. How would we uh, be in harmony with the populations that are close to mind? I, that's a good one. I, I didn't really explore that too deeply. Look, we live in the world of social, social technology, right? Many of you, and I know I have, you know, we're connecting here at this congress with people on linkedin and we're making new friends and and connections and and we're finding ways to dialogue from all parts of the world you know i know that there's some of you here we've you know we've connected on linkedin and we'll probably share some messages you know these tools make it possible for us to to connect with people in new and interesting ways and uh, maybe find ways to be transparent and open about what's going on right but um, mining companies in particular have been very slow to tap into some of these ways that we can engage with the communities around us, how we can communicate openly. Oftentimes, the only way that someone could really understand what a mining company is doing in their community is if they go to the AGM reports and go dig through 500 pages of stuff and see, see oh, look, they're doing some stuff in Port Hedland. You know, like, like they have to go discover, and we're not doing a very good job of going out and communicating. Sometimes, uh, tragically, I think a lot of mining companies uh, think that community engagement is, uh, you know, buying shirts for the local soccer team or something, right? Which is good. It's a good thing, but it's not real engagement. And we have all these social platforms. I'm not saying you have to have a Facebook account for all your stakeholders, right? But, but there are a lot of tools. There are a lot of tools and a lot of interesting ways that we could really explore how to effectively engage with the broader communities around us. And, and we, we, we've not been good at that. And, and so far as I know, I've not seen many good efforts uh, out there of people really, really looking to find, use some of these technologies. And I think they're there. They're there for us to be able to communicate better and we've not really used them. So I think that's, you know, for me, that's one of the ways um, that uh, I think uh, is a key one. What advice would you give young miners in Latin America? Well, look, you know, I have to be careful here because uh, to be truthful, I don't know a huge amount about Latin American mining in one sense, 
But one of the beautiful things about mining is mining is kind of mining. You know, whenever I go around the world and you talk to people in the mining industry, we're kind of the same. You know, we have the same issues, same challenges. And, um, and so there's some, definitely some, some uh, commonalities. Well, look, what I would say is, you know, to young miners, to people uh, starting out in, the, in their careers with mining, is that I think mining is a great industry. I'll tell you one of the reasons why, um, uh, why, uh, why I love mining, and that is, uh, for me, it's a blend of, of IT, uh, the corporate kind of IT, and the industrial technology stuff. And th that blend, for me, makes it a very interesting space. I like also the fact that it's a very pragmatic business. Um, you know, we don't make things shiny unless they need to be shiny. We're about solving real problems. And mining companies often don't spend money unless it actually solves some problem. Well, it's not entirely true sometimes. But, but um, so I think, I think mining is a great industry to be in. So I, I think it's a, it's a good place to, to sort of um, get, in, get involved in. And, and, and I think for many people can be a very fruitful and enjoyable career in a very interesting environment. Um, I also think, though, for young people, you know, you've, you've got an opportunity to sort of help shape and deal with some of those expectations, those problems that we that we have as an industry to help help begin to change the mindsets. Um, one of the things I do notice is that a lot of the mining schools now, uh, I know certainly this is true in, in in our city, but a lot of the young people coming through, they they they're learning data science as part of their mining degrees. You know, they're mining engineers, but they're learning data science. Uh, they're metallurgists, but they're learning data science. And I think that's brilliant because you know what, what I've discovered with this is that we've got these young people coming to us, whereas before uh, a guy might come to us and he's, um, you know, he, he, his first instinct is I've got data, so let me, let me take it out of the historian and, uh, and put it into an Excel and then I can play in Excel because you know that's what I know. Whereas now, now we're finding that we've got all these new graduates coming through who they think, how do I, how do, how do I get Python working on my computer because I want to I want to access the database and start doing some proper stuff here with this data. And so they're bringing new skills. And I think those are really important. So my encouragement to you, if you're a young person, is bring that stuff, bring that stuff to your business. You will, find, you will find opposition. Because in every business, there's the old people like me who uh, we haven't done it that way before. So, you know, when people come with all these crazy ideas, we're like, eh, calm yourself down. You know, that's a bit weird. But just keep trying. Because I think the business actually needs you to keep bringing the new ideas, right? So I guess that would be my, my broad encouragement. Um, really quickly, I've got a minute 46 in your experience. How can we reach communities? Uh, I don't know who have done that one. Um, how do you see the industry in a few years? Well, look, I actually think, I think mining is, is in for, you know, we use that word disruption. Uh, we've seen disruption happen in a lot of sectors. I don't know exactly. I've seen people with a lot of ideas about what disruption in mining is going to look like. But, but I think there's no doubt in my mind that we are ripe for disruption of some kind. Um, part of that is driven by, if you take a look at the broader trends and you pay attention. Uh, for instance, I have a BMW. BMW have started to buy into mining companies to secure their supply chain around key ingredients like cobalt and lithium, right? Because they want to build electric cars and they want to run out of stuff to build them, right? So they want to get that right. And also, they want to be able to buy this stuff from reputable places that are not going to impact their brand. Where in five years' time, people go, oh, but you've been using child labor to produce your cars. That won't work, that won't work well, right? So we have these companies that are big brands who are thinking about getting involved in mining. They're investing in mining or they're, they're, they're creating big relationships with, with mining entities that I think will have an impact in terms of the way mining companies operate, uh, just because of the, uh, a different way of thinking about business and, and those things. So I think, I think we're going to see some stuff. I think technology is going to change a lot for us. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, uh, and I'll finish with this thought, I'm hoping that we can somehow find a way to elevate the importance and the value of mining to the world. Because if I go back to that slide of the batteries for an electric vehicle, and we see the, just the enormous requirements that have to be, have to be provided somehow. Uh, mining is not going to become less important in this world. It's going to become more important. But we're going to have to do it differently. Uh, because the, 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 the roll-on costs of what mining currently has associated with it will need to be dealt with around environmental, around social license, all this stuff. We're going to have to deal with that stuff. And I think that's going to be a big challenge for us. But if we can pull that off, I think I'm, I'm hoping that mining will actually begin to be seen as a good thing, not, not necessarily a, a bad thing, which it is in some communities. And that's not a healthy thing. 
All right, so thank you very much. I'm going to be around. If you've got any more questions, because I see some more popped up there, I'm always happy over coffee or um, a pisco sour to give you my best wisdom, and, uh, and we will enjoy that. Thank you very much.